Uh, we very much welcome you to the third panel in this wonderful discussion um, with interested faculty members of the humanities, past fellows, um, and people associated with the Humanities Center. The, the topic of the, th the third panel is media and technology. Um, in a way, it allows us to move very easily from the discussion we were having about science and, and humanists, if ever there was a great moment um, for um, humanists, it's when they discovered a particular technology of media called movable type. <laughs> but I suspect that um, as important as that moment was, I suspect that our panelists will be talking about uh, more recent uh, media. Um, I regret to say that at the very last moment, um, Leo Coleman, um, who was the fellow for the program Sacred Ecology, um, had, had to cancel. But we have three wonderful speakers, and uh, let me, uh, I will introduce you as you, right before you give your talk. So, uh, Professor Carol Finnegan um, is going to speak first. Uh, she is Associate Professor of Communication and Conrad Humanities Scholar of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Illinois Champaign. Uh, Urbana Champaign. <laughs> um, she is a scholar of rhetoric and visual politics whose research examines the historical and contemporary role of photography as a tool for public life. Um, she is the author of a series of really interesting sounding books, um, Picturing Poverty, Print Culture, and the FSA Photographs. Uh, she is the co-editor of Visual Rhetoric, a Reader in Communication and American Culture, and the forthcoming Reading Photography's Viewers Recognizing Visual Politics from the Civil War to the Great Depression. Uh, Finnegan was the Warren Center Visiting Fellow in 2006-07 under the program theme Between Word and Image. Thank you, Helmut. And, uh, in the interest of keeping us all alert after lunch, I have pictures. Um, uh, I want to echo my fellow former fellows, say that three times fast, uh, and, and thank the Warren Center and especially Mona Frederick for her leadership and vision all of these years and for, uh, as Maurice so well put it this morning, for her generosity of spirit. Um, my year at the Warren Center seems like it was not that long ago and I'm sort of horrified uh, that I'm only now finishing the book. Uh, that uh, I thought I was going to finish that year, but I blame, uh, not Mona this time, but I blame my fellow fellows and, and all of the interactions I had at the Warren Center for turning that project enough on its head to give me a lot to think about. Uh, and so um, it is different, um, I think, as John Sloop said in last night's film, than it uh, was when it started, and that's important and useful. This year's 25th anniversary of the Warren Center is also the 25th anniversary of the digital revolution in photography. Yeah, look out for shadow figures. Uh, for example, Photoshop was born in 1987 and the first commercially available digital camera was produced in 1988. Today, probably every single person in this room has one camera on their person right now, if not more than one. I have two in my bag. Uh, 175 years ago, photography appeared in the scene with the daguerreotype, a one-of-a-kind, unreproducible photographic object. Now 250 million photographs are uploaded to Facebook each day. And in 2012, Fortune magazine reported that 10% of all photos ever taken were taken in 2011. Take a moment. Think about that. In my time today, I'll begin by sharing three examples that point to ways digital imaging has transformed photography and therefore transformed all of us. Then I'll offer a few questions that invite those of us in the humanities to think about the role of photography in public life today. Example one, looking for Lincoln. In November 2007, USA Today broke the news of recently discovered images of Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg. These were not new photographs. They were stereo negatives that had been in the possession of the Library of Congress for decades. But only after the year 2000 were they digitized. 
by studying high-resolution digital scans of images made by Alexander Gardner in 3D. Uh, you may know stereo images were meant to be viewed in a 3D viewer in the late 19th century. Historian John Richter was able to identify two photographs that included President Lincoln among the gathered crowd. Please notice the images on the top. That's the actual photograph that the Library of Congress had in its possession. Lincoln on a horse in a black stovepipe hat. Got to be him, right? Until Richter's discovery, there had been only one known photograph of Lincoln at Gettysburg. But it was not until the advent of digital imaging that those who knew where to look could see into the photographs to find all of the visual information they contained. Nobody knew it, but Lincoln was there hiding all along. On November, uh, example two, Hipstomatic goes to war. On November 21st, 2010, the New York Times published a front page feature story as part of its Year at War series, which focused on the experiences of a unit of soldiers in Afghanistan. The piece included photographs by Pulitzer Prize winner Damon Winter. In early 2011, Winter won the Photographer of the Year Award from Pictures of the Year International, in part for photos he produced for this New York Times piece. What garnered the most attention, however, was not the quality of the reporting and photography, but the way Winter made his images, using his iPhone and a photography app called Hipstamatic. Hipstamatic enables users to mimic the old-school retro look of analog cameras, lenses, flashes, and filters. Winter stated that his choice to use Hipstamatic grew out of his feeling that the story warranted it. He told the New York Times, composing with the iPhone is more casual and less deliberate, and the soldiers often take photographs of each other with their phones, so they were more comfortable than if I had had my regular camera. While many readers and fellow photographers applauded the images, calling them painterly, beautiful, captivating, and elegant, others termed them unsettling and wondered whether the use of an iPhone app was appropriate for a professional photojournalist in a theater of war. Was, as one critic put it, the Hipstamatic series proof that, quote, photojournalism in its purest form was over? Winter said no, arguing that he had made the images through his eye, not the apps. Yet the concerns of many seemed prescient when three years later, just this past spring, the Chicago Sun-Times fired its full-time photo staff and stated that their absence would be made up for by teaching reporters how to make iPhone photographs. Every time I talk about this, I feel like I'm reading an Onion article. <laughs> Tongue firmly in cheek, Stephen Colbert responded to the public outcry by noting that reporters could simply use the Pulitzer Prize winner filter on Instagram. Example three, the Pope makes a selfie. This section of my talk was originally going to be titled, The Obama Girls Make a Selfie, but that was before Pope Francis got into the act three weeks ago, posing with teenagers at the Vatican. What was touted, my favorite part of this is that they hashtag it selfie, I love that. What was touted uh, as the first papal selfie was a bit of a misnomer, however, because although you can be in someone else's selfie, it's not a selfie unless it's you operating the camera. Self-portraits predate photography, of course, but selfies owe their 21st century origins to the rise of hyper-personalized social media spaces such as MySpace and Facebook and the increasing ease with which smartphone users can both make photographs and share them. Selfies are the currency of teenagers, celebrities, and, well, nearly everybody using social media. Even people who hate selfies post selfies tagged, I hate selfies. <laughs> the UK's Telegraph reported this past summer that a national survey of young people revealed that selfies accounted in the UK for 30% of pictures taken by adults aged 18 to 24. And you all thought you were part of the me generation. One selfie made by someone in that age group uh, caused controversy this past summer when Rolling Stone magazine elected to use a selfie made by accused Boston bomber Jokar Sarnayev on its cover. Protesting the cover, the Boston Globe's Ty Burr both defined the ideology of the selfie 
and lambasted its use in this instance. The selfie is our modern mirror, he wrote. When you take a selfie, you are imagining yourself as you'd like to be, as who you'd like to be. You are engaging in persona management, the creation of a cuter, cooler, more glamorous you. By putting this Sarnayev on the cover, Rolling Stone at best plays with and at worst buys into the accused's own, accused own manufactured image. Casual but potent, speaking in a language we all understand. So those are my three examples. What ties these examples together and what hints at challenges we who study photography face can be summed up in three words. Archive, agency, app. First, archive. The digital, res res uh, excuse me, the digital revolution has transformed not only the ways we produce photographs, but the ways we reproduce, circulate, respond to, and store photographs. For those of us who study photography's history, the rise of digital imaging has improved the ease and speed with which we may locate and study photographs. When I began writing my dissertation on the Farm Security Administration project in 1997, the Library of Congress was just beginning its digitization efforts. All that was available online were about 1,400 of the FSA's color images, which are extremely tiny uh, amount of the overall archive. By the time the book based on my dissertation was published six years later, nearly the entire FSA file had been digitized and was searchable and you could all do it right now while I'm talking. Yet it isn't only access to the archive that matters, as the example of finding Lincoln at Gettysburg shows. The digital revolution in imaging is giving us access to the same images, but differently. The increased ability to enhance, blow up, to see into the photograph, especially the rich, dense images made by early cameras, this is providing more visual information and opening up more avenues for interpretation. As photography historian Martha Sandweiss puts it, digital technologies thus make it possible for researchers to see images that the original photographers never saw. The digital revolution also unsettles or perhaps even explodes our traditional ideas about the archive. What will constitute the public archive of historical images in an era where anyone with a cell phone can click and share? What is the status of the single image when photography is less about documenting and more about sharing? Will photographs themselves have currency as future objects for study? Wither the family album in a world of selfies? Next, agency. The rise of digital photography is also transforming our understanding of the relationship between photography and agency, but in ways curiously resonant of photography's earliest periods. Anxieties about the takeover of photojournalism by iPhones are familiar. When photography appeared in 1839, it was lauded for removing the hand of the artist from composition. Just as quickly, of course, photographers emphasized their agency as artists and creators and professionals. Debates today about digital tools and who uses them echo these earlier anxieties. The availability of such tools points to the very democratization that photography was supposed to bring about 175 years ago. Selfie culture vividly performs the tension surrounding agency as makers of selfies use cheap, easily accessible tools to structure identity, massage self-representation, and chronicle daily life experience in public and in private. In this seemingly democratic but also self-centered space, will historians of the future judge us by our selfies? And that brings me to my final theme, the app. Notice how photo apps describe themselves. Instagram is a fast, beautiful, and fun way to share your life with friends and family. And Hipstamatic says, capture and curate life's best moments with photography. Sharing, capturing, curating. Certainly these terms echo the Kodak moments of the past, but they also point to a transformation in our relationship to photographic practice. As Wired's Pete Brook puts it, photography is less about document or evidence and more about community and experience. And that's not a bad thing. Perhaps instead of thinking about the best apps for photography, we should be thinking about the current apps of photography. What are contemporary applications of photography doing with, for, and to us? 
how do the various ways we encounter photography today on screens large and small, in social media, filtered, made mainly by ourselves or others we know, how are these things transforming our sense of what constitutes the photographic experience? What does it mean to be all at once the maker, sharer, and consumer of photographs? And more broadly, how might these kinds of questions be taken up in our histories, criticism, theories, or ethics? The rise of digital photography in the last 25 years did not raise these questions, to be sure, but they have given them a different value, tone, and texture. And those of us interested in visual politics and culture, and really, that should be all of us, have a lot of work ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Really interesting stuff. Um, the next speaker is Richard Grusin. Do I pronounce that right? Uh, S, not a Z. Grusin. Thank you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> German pronunciation. Sorry. Um, he's the director of the Center for 21st Century Studies and professor of English at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. He received his PhD in 1983 from the uh, University of California, Berkeley, and he has published um, numerous chapters and, art and written four books. The first one, Transcendentalist Hermeneutics, Institutional Authority in the Higher Criticism of the Bible, is about the influence of European and German theories of biblical interpretation on the New England Transcendentalists. The next book seems to me suggest a shift in gears. <laughs> he has uh, then thereafter he wrote um, a series of books, one with uh, J. Bol uh, J. David Bolter called Remediation, Understanding New Media. Uh, another a single author, Culture, Technology, and the Creation of Amer America's National Parks. And still another, Premediation, uh, after, uh, I'm sorry, Effect and mediality after 9-11. He was the Warren Center Visiting Fellow in 1999-2000 for the program Construction, Destructions, and Deconstructions of Nature. Thank you. Okay, so first, uh, somebody's got to say it. Mona could be kind of a bitch sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when Carolina lost uh, to Duke. I mean, those days, if you walked into the office, it was not a good place to be. But seriously, I only said that because Mona really doesn't like or says she doesn't like all of these compliments. So I wanted to at least give her something else. Um, with everybody else, uh, I'm uh, totally grateful to Mona, and I'm really super excited about the fact that having become a center director myself uh, in 2010, I get to see Mona uh, on a regular basis now at our annual meetings, uh, the next one, which will be in Hong Kong, so we're going to be having a good time uh, there. Anyway, so thanks, Mona, and thanks, everybody. Um, next thing is, sorry, uh, I, I need to take a selfie. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I'll put it up on Facebook uh, and on Twitter with the hashtag. Um, it, it usually takes me like at least 10 minutes just to get warmed up, so you know, don't expect me really to say anything here today in, in these 10 minutes, um, but I'll try. Um, the, Mona asked us to talk about changes in the study of media and technology over the past 25 years, and um, unlike many of my younger colleagues, I've actually been able to watch those changes in academia over that time, and so I thought it might be useful to, for me just to sort of talk about my own journey in relation to uh, digital media especially, um, both, uh, well, I think that it's an easy way. Uh, how to do that. Um, okay, so uh, really I've been fortunate to have been part of these changes through not just my writing but also my institutional affiliations. I came to Georgia Tech 27 years ago in 1986 and was really excited that my office was equipped with an IBM dual floppy uh, computer. And, uh, 
although it took me really about I'd say two weeks to realize that I needed to have a word perfect software to run the word processor and that short of buying it which was it was fairly expensive at those days um, you know the only thing I could do would be to you know borrow a copy from uh, a colleague which is what I what I did um, being a copyright pirate I think from the beginning um, so while I was at Georgia Tech it was a really interesting time in 1988 the beginning of this 25 year period we uh, had a new president who came who invited us to uh, develop degree programs in the humanities and social sciences that were specific to the mission of Georgia Tech. And we developed an undergraduate program, and I was an untenured assistant professor, but had the good fortune of being involved in both of these programs. We developed an undergraduate program in uh, science, technology, and culture, and then a master's degree in information design and technology. And so the department intellectually was doing a kind of cultural studies of science and technology, and um, Shall, you, shall we say practically or pragmatically, was involved in uh, training people to uh, do new media, uh, really CD-ROM design and development back in 1990, uh, because the DVD was just a dream at that point. And so this program, uh, very early on, uh, was involved in integrating technology into humanities education, both in terms of uh, developing technology and developing applications and uh, CD-ROMs and eventually websites and so forth and in terms of studying it critically and historically. And I think that what we were aiming for at that time and what, I, what we accomplished in the undergraduate program and in the master's program but never finally in the PhD program during my time there, there is now a PhD program at Georgia Tech that doesn't quite do what we were hoping to do then. What we were doing was trying to integrate a kind of critical study of science and technology with the implementation of, in particular, technologies, media technologies. And we felt that it would be important not to be, for students who use these digital media technologies, not to be mystified by them, but to understand not just how to use them, but to understand the social, political, cultural, and, so, and other implications of digital technologies. Um, at that time in the 90s, I was arguing, in fact, at the, in 2000 uh, at the uh, plenary at the Society for Literature and Science Conference, a uh, plenary I was on with uh, Catherine Hales, I made the argument that if English departments didn't incorporate new media technology and digital technology into their curricula, that they would run the risk of becoming uh, of a fate similar to classics departments, that is to say, of losing uh, significant numbers of faculty, students, and significant power in the university. And that's the position we were in, certainly that I was in, in the late 90s. And when I said incorporate technology, what I meant by that, what I imagined by that, was actually a kind of reconfiguration of the curriculum in which non-human technologies, and now I would even go further, uh, would say non-humans more broadly, would uh, have their place. So in the same way that the curriculum and the canon had opened up space for uh, writers, human writers, who had been marginalized or voiceless, uh, women writers, minority writers, and so forth, I think that what I imagined and, and still actually imagine today is uh, a curriculum and a canon that opens up and gives voice to non-humans as well. Uh, and whether those be as in something like animal studies, living non-humans, or whether it be the inorganic earth or uh, ecosystems as in eco-criticism or environmental philosophy or other, or whether it be technology itself. So what I imagined was a kind of reconfiguration of the Western canon, for example, in which texts that had been invisible came to the forefront, texts which engaged questions of technology, and in particular questions of the, what I see as the coevolution of the human and the technical. And this is sort of the, the vision that I had, and I felt that if, hum if humanities departments didn't do this, that they really ran the risk of marginalization and uh, so forth. Um, in and this happened in the kind of hyper-enthusiasm and explosion of the sort of go-go 90s. In 2001, 
I moved to Wayne State and uh, about three months in Detroit. And about three months after I got there, 9/11 happened. And 9/11 was an event, geopolitical event, but also a really important event in media technology because we really saw, because of the needs of the perceived needs, in any case, of security, surveillance, and, and anti-terror, uh, anti-terror formations, let's say state formations, we saw a real proliferation of big data and of data that was uh, interested in, uh, well, ways of mining large data sets in order to preempt possible terrorist attacks in particular. And what that led to, I think, or maybe coincidentally, was the development of a whole set of media that we think of today as just, you know, part of the landscape none of which existed before 2001. So, for example, before 9-11. So, the first iPod launched on October 23rd, 2001. I mean, the iPod seems ancient, but at 9-11, nobody owned an iPod. Um, MySpace was launched in August 2003. Facebook, February 4th, 2004. The iPod Nano, September 7th, 2005. Twitter, July 15th, 2006 nearly a year before the iPhone, June 29, 2007. Foursquare, March 11, 2009. Instagram or pictogram, much you know, later than that, and so forth. So all of these daily mobile technologies that we carry with us, that we interact with on a regular basis, are post-9-11 developments. And all of those technologies generate transaction data, you know, billions of pieces of transaction data that are available to be, uh, well, for algorithms, powerful algorithms to run through and to be mined and so forth. And we see from recent revelations about the NSA that this, in fact, uh, is happening and is happening not just in the U.S. but globally as well. And this has really changed, I think, the shape of media and technology. Um, so finally, I have no idea where I am on time. Where am I? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so in that case, I've got a story now. Uh, no, we're doing it. So, uh, a couple, then, just a couple of last points I think I want to make. I think one is just to say, just to underscore why I've been sort of rehearsing these technological developments, is to say that certainly in the field of media studies, uh, and I think culturally, generally, cultural and media formations have gone hand in hand with technological developments. And so when I wrote Remediation with Jay Bolter, we were responding to a certain uh, moment of uh, development in new media, a certain kind of cyber enthusiasm that was happening in the 80s and 90s about virtual reality, for example, about cyberspace, about these technologies as a place to escape from the materiality of the real world, which we all re know really couldn't or didn't happen. And when I wrote pre-mediation, I was responding to what I saw as the shift in media technologies and a shift in a kind of cultural media logic towards preemption and pre-mediation of things before they happen. And all of our social media have built into them, I think, anticipatory, responsive um, format. So that when you post a Facebook status, nobody posts a Facebook status to be immediately real. They post it because of what they anticipate will happen. People will like it, share it, comment on it, and so forth. You, you post, a, you tweet because you want to be retweeted or favorited, and so forth. And many of these technologies have shifted a kind of temporality towards the future and towards a kind of what I see as now this logic of pre-mediation that we operate in. So finally, uh, that was sort of my a bit of a discursus, but just to kind of explain some of why I wanted to um, highlight these kind of technological shifts. I want to return, though, at the end to uh, the question, to the position that I took in the 90s about English departments and about the humanities, I think, generally needing to become, to embrace technology. Because ironically, or maybe paradoxically, uh, they have. English departments, digital humanities has, is a growth industry insofar as there is any growth in the humanities these days. And there has been a kind of, I think, 
recognition that the humanities need to incorporate and uh, digital media. And I think that this is on the one hand a good thing, but on the other hand I'm not really thrilled personally with the way, with all of the ways that this incorporation has proceeded. And I think that a lot of it sadly has gone in lockstep with a kind of neoliberal accounting of education. That is to say, the idea that we were talking about earlier that higher education has to be useful if it's going to be supported. That the aim of college, this is now a truism, that you know the aim of college is to train students for jobs and to train students for the jobs that employers want. And one of the things that has fueled the development in digital humanities, not the only thing by any mean, is in fact this kind of uh, desire for utility and a desire for uh, producing students who can do things in the kind of digital industry. And as useful as it is to have students doing this, I think that what we run the risk now by the success of digital humanities of doing what I thought would happen if we didn't embrace digital media. That is, we run the risk of marginalizing and making irrelevant the study of literature, of culture, in ways that it has existed, that, they have, that study has existed historically. And so it seems to me that we have not yet done what I really wanted us to do in the 90s, which was to use this engagement with the newest technologies of representation, communication, and so forth, to reconceptualize and rethink what we do, not to dismiss it, but to find other kinds of texts to read, other so kinds of images to look at, other kinds of histories that might have been untold before, and to do it in a way that integrates the sort of sort of traditional historical and methodological approaches that we've brought with the humanities with new digital technologies. And this is happening. I mean, it's not that nobody is doing this uh, by any means, and there's a lot of good work that is. But I think there's still too much of a divide in the humanities right now, and I'm actually, I actually have been writing a little bit against the idea of digital humanities as a kind of term or as a kind of branding. I think that digital humanities should be just the humanities as they're being done in the 21st century under, I mean, Helmut mentioned, you know, movable type. Well, you know, well, so now we have new technologies that we're using, but I don't think that the fact that we're using the new technology should be a virtue in itself. I think the question has to do with what kinds of critique, analysis, creative work, and so forth we are doing, and what kinds of interrogations of some of the implications of these that we're doing as well. Um, and I won't even get started on the question of MOOCs. Thanks very much. Our third, thank you very much. Our third panelist is Stephen Rackman. He is Associate Chair for Graduate Studies in the Department of English and Director of the American Studies Program and Co-Director of the Digital Humanities Literary Cognition Laboratory at Michigan State University. He specializes in 19th century American literature and has written numerous books and articles on Edgar Allan Poe, uh, literature and medicine, cities, popular culture, and an award-winning website on Sunday school books for the Library of Congress American Memory Project. He was the 2002, uh, I'm sorry, the 2003-2004 William S. Vaughn Visiting Fellow at the Robert Penn Warren Center. Um, he is past president of the Poe Studies Association and currently he is completing a study of Edgar Allan Poe entitled The Jingle Man, Edgar Allan Poe and the Problems of Culture. Oh, finally I wanted to say he, is the, he was the visiting fellow f under the program Medicine, Health and Society. Thank you. Um, can, can you hear me? With, is this mic up high enough? Okay. Um, well, I, I have to thank Mona, not um, at the risk of repeating what everyone else has said, just simply because it's impossible not to thank her. Um, it's also a kind of a delight to be here because uh, you get to see a deeper level of interdisciplinarity than when you were here under the fellowship with the, the wonderful cohort. And I see 
Matt and Matt Ramsey and Arlene Tuckman. Larry Churchill's not here, but I need to thank them too for, for bringing me to Vanderbilt. Um, I think a lot of the feelings that were voiced in the morning session are things that I felt in, in my own life. And one of the things about coming here was a, a level of dignity with which the humanities are treated uh, and a kind of, um, a, a kind of an assumption of specialness and an assumption of interdisciplinarity. Uh, rather than that kind of inertial resistance we often feel uh, to interdisciplinary. Um, I often talk about interdisciplinarity and, and say to my students now, uh, if you want to be interdisciplinary, you're going to be offending at least two disciplines at the same time. Um, and, and, and you know, this is something I think when we champion it, we, we of course uh, want to downplay the friction because we want people to participate in this. But, it doesn't mean that it's an easy thing to do, and, and the, the comments about deep and superficial in many ways have to do with politeness, um, or sometimes they have to do with uh, learning a language. You know, you're learning a new language, and, and, and we know language acquisition takes time. Uh, and, and so, in a certain way, um, those things are there. I was delight, delighted to see that the medicine, human, um, health and society, this sort of idea that was being shared by some enthusiasts at a moment has gained a kind of institutional traction here that's kind of astonishing. Um, and yet, yet, in another way, I think, according to what I'm going to speak about, I think it makes a certain amount of sense. Um, maybe our Katie's point about the biological sciences having a certain degree of prestige that the physical uh, physics, or uh, nuclear physics in particular, had at a certain moment, or maybe rocket science. Uh, all the cliches, brain surgery, rocket science, which one is harder, right? Um, there's a certain sense that uh, there's attraction in our study towards the biological uh, that we recognize, but there's also a need to oppose that. And, and, and when we were coming, because medicine has been a place that has been so technologized, and because it deals with our bodies and our minds in fundamental ways, it was a flashpoint, I think, for uh, interdisciplinary inquiry, and it remains one, and, and certainly, and certainly, I think it will only grow. Um, when I, uh, the idea from the history of medicine that I think animates my remarks today, uh, is one that in the 19th century, um, it was often thought that uh, technology drove uh, this sort of um, uh, mechanization of the human body. Uh, but what, what um, John Warner, I think, John Harley Warner, one of my advisors in history of medicine, discovered was that actually the ideology of the technologization of the human body was in advance of any technological sort of developments. And that you find in case studies a shift that occurs in the way that patients are treated even before we get what we think of as classic medical advances. And so this notion that, you know, I, I'm no techno-determinist, but I think there's an, a, a complicated relationship to think about how technology works um, that, that I would like to think about. So um, I, I sort of begin here with, uh, if as Heidegger asserts, humanity's relationship to technology entails a poesis, a making and a revealing, then we may well ask, what have the developments in media and technology over the last 25 years made and revealed. Um, and to me, maybe, I'm not that he Heideggerian. I, I think I'm closer to Raymond Williams in the sense that I think that there are uh, concepts in culture that are precipitate and there are those that are in solution and uh, semantically available to us and sometimes not quite articulable. But the process and experience and the use of technology, as we've seen in the, the papers here, becomes a way of making these things available to us, sometimes in neologisms, sometimes in new frames of reference. Um, and so in order to answer this kind of question, I thought that I would begin with a kind of proto-quote that I found from, well, Robert Penn Warren. Um, in the 1970s, he gave a series of lectures called Democracy and Poetry, um, and uh, he's thinking about problems of culture in these lectures, um, citing the French uh, sociologist and Christian anarchist Jacques Ellul. Um, he asserts that modern technology was perpetrating a fundamental assault on individual identity, quote, because the individual is regarded as an expendable because replaceable part. Um, the important fact, Warren explained, and here's Warren, is not the individual's relation to any one field of technology, but what Elu called the phenomenon of technical convergence. For Warren, the cumulative effect of this technical convergence was centripetal. 
quote, and here's Warren again, many forces bearing in from the periphery toward the individual, each with its implied message that the individual is not really a self, but a machine. Now this position consolidated a very durable line of te technological culture critique throughout the 20th century, seen in the sort of mechanization takes command arguments of Siegfried Gideon, the dystopian visions I think of Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee, which is 1890s, uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, Arthur C. Clarke, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and cultural critics like Jakob Bernhardt and uh, Warren's colleague at Yale, Lewis Mumford. Um, it also entailed the forgetting of the past, a kind of aggressive cultural amnesia summed up by such aggressive technologists like Henry Ford, who famously uttered, history is bunk. Um, and I would think by the 70s, when he's making these lectures, you know, pop culture was fused with this. I remember Bob Seger, a great Michigan poet, had a, um, had a song, uh, I feel like a number, I'm not a number. Um, you know, Michigan assembly line, factories, mechanization, those kinds of notions. But Warren's corollary to this thesis via Elul sociology was not that one particular technology, the assembly line, atomic power, television were the common targets, um, but a constellation of technologies were encircling the individual. And here we may pause to consider uh, whether this centripetal process constitutes perhaps a form of Heideggerian inframing um, or a form of Althusserian interpolation of the self. Um, that sense that not just the state apparatus is interpolating the self, but the technologies that we use to surround ourselves. Um, it seems to be resonant with both concepts. I, I, I'm not sure which I would put more, more salient, though. The, this constellation or matrix of technological and corporate encirclement, because he mentions that corporate power is aligned to this technical notion, is shaping individual identity. And this seems to be anticipatory of the development we would undergo in the internet age. Uh, a convergence of technologies surrounding and even more than that interpenetrating the self. And I think we could find any number of expressions of the sense of things. It seems to be Google Glass is kind of the latest apotheosis of a kind of visual surround. Um, uh, and now that the humanities would be an enterprise that would define itself in opposition to this process seems clear enough. Um, uh, first, the humanities would assign itself the task of articulating the state of relations because that state of relations is, uh, there are so many forces which are trying to naturalize that and to make that invisible, uh, make that assumed. Um, so what Warren and many other cultural critics would be doing there. Secondly, the humanities would find its own interdisciplinary matrix of discourses to surround the self and send oppositional messages. And in some sense, I think the convergence of technology required some opposing convergence. Um, that we might find the interdisciplinary impulse itself in this opposition. That question of why interdisciplinarity. And I, I did a Google engram on the word interdisciplinary, and it takes a rise in 1970 and then explodes in 1985 uh, a, as a term of currency. Um, I don't know if you know the engrams, but it's, it, it's a blunt instrument, but it nonetheless, it, it, it measures currency. Um, and in a certain way, that, that seems to be uh, right for this sort of history that I'm charting. So a kind of intellectual judo through which we harness and interrogate the technologies that are uh, at once all around us. Um, and, and if you've ever used Google Docs with a bunch of people, there's a funny, you know, because writing is such an interior activity. And then you watch someone else's cursor, and I have a psychotic moment where it gets in my head. Like, that person's cursor and what they're writing and what I'm writing is sort of in this moment. And I find, okay, this is a moment where this technology is really penetrating my consciousness in a way that is fundamentally other to me. It's other, it's powerful, but alien. Um, okay, another quote that I, I thought, um, this is from the Cultural Studies Reader, Simon During's sort of Rutledge kind of handy dandy classic. Uh, with a number of consolidated sort of statements. This is uh, one of the lesser read essays in there by Madelart, Delacorte, and Madelart on, on the international image market. And they begin this essay, mid-90s, uh, the increasing commercialization of the culture sector and the parallel developments of new technologies of communication have projected culture into the heart of industrial and political structures. The relationship between culture and industry is gradually being added to a debate formerly centered on that between culture and the state. 
an extension which has produced a rupture with existing definitions of culture. Now, for people situated in France, I think this is even more sort of a problem, but exactly that kind of state of relations has been going on in the United States. Now, the critique here does not seek to describe the problem in terms of self and society, as in Warren's critique, but now places the emphasis on corporatization of culture and the technological mechanisms that would promote this kind of shift. We, of course, know that that's precisely what's happened to our universities. Uh, the interpenetration of the university through a corporate culture and through the technologies of corporate culture. Uh, the teaching technologies that you fear about marginalization are precisely the ones that are those mechanisms. So, um, and that's one side of the problem. The losing, uh, loosening of controls on culture, especially fueled by the desktop computer, shifted a the agency of culture away from nation states toward the World Wide Web, towards transnational corporate entities. Um, technologies are, were still surrounding the self, or at least the self's lines of sight, but much of the emphasis fell on cultural convergence. Um, and as I said, the Google glassing is one part. This, um, this digital turn uh, in which software takes command, uh, to, to quote one book that sort of studies this, also began providing powerful interfaces which disguised or concealed the na mechanical nature of this surround. Um, and we, of course, know that the cyborg interface, the idea, why don't people feel alienated by computer technologies, or certain people don't and certain people do. But part of it is that um, those digital technologies, of course, simulate reality, simulate human behavior. So rather than confronting a machine, you're confronting a machine that, doesn't, that sounds like Siri, um, that sounds like something else, that creates a visual interface for that. It disguises that mechanical nature, enabling avatars and digital persona to connect with other avatars and other digital or analog persona, um, not only minimizing the sense of social alienation that was prevalent in the mechanical age, but aggressively promoting a sense of sociality, a kind of interconnectedness that we've grown familiar with, a kind of social networking, quotidian tweeting, status updates, all of those kinds of things. But also, that networking seems to me directly related to the impulse behind the humanities center, behind interdisciplinarity. Um, that there's a sense that we, maybe we're all just ants trying not to drown and holding on to one another, um, but there's this, this notion of a necessary interconnectedness now. It's imperative. Um, we, we can no longer, where discipline was once our strength, and our reason for differentiation now, uh, it's imperative that we, we, we reach out of that. Um, so, so sort of to conclude these kinds of ruminations, um, I'd like to just suggest some of the symptoms uh, of the predicament that this critique points toward. Um, and we can find an interdisciplinary um, scholarship. One was mentioned this morning, it's the cultural turn. Um, now, when I was here in 2003, we spent a good deal of time discussing the cultural turn in the history of medicine, which had a lag with the cultural turn in sort of uh, general cultural studies. Um, but there was a certain sense here that we had to look beyond certain medical explanations uh, and towards the anthropological, towards some interdisciplinary nexus. Um, uh, and, and of course, this echoed the cultural turn of the 19th century in a certain way, which faced mechanization. But it, it, was, it was one symptom, I think, of the particular modes that we're talking about. I think the global cosmopolitan turn um, that we've seen in scholarship uh, moving away from, uh, it used to be, you know, the critique of American studies was that it was national, imperial, hegemonic, then it had to be hemispheric studies, then hemispheric wasn't good enough, so we had transatlantic studies, and then that wasn't good enough, so we had to have, now we have global studies. And of course, we run up against the capacities of any one person to be a mastery, master of any of these things, and that leads us to generalism, which leads us to deans who cut us, right? Um, <laughs> Um, and, and there's a certain sense of disciplinary evaporation within the global, even as we applaud ourselves in, in trying to imagine that. Because uh, in a certain sense, it's mirroring the problem of global corporate sort of functions in a way. Um, uh, I think another lesser known phenomenon uh, with respect to technology, uh, but, but nonetheless is important, is that figurative tropes that emerge with technologies um, as they are experienced in use, lose their metaphoricity. They become demetaphorized and become literal in a certain sense. And I feel that what's happening, of course, with, with a lot of our technology, so, so for example, we all use PowerPoint and call them slides. They're not. Um, uh, there, there's, there's so many things that are not what they actually are. In fact, there was a memorandum that came out from Whitehall uh, 
talking about corporate euphemisms uh, and a list of corporate euphemisms that were going to be banned in British memoranda because there was too much of this. And I'll just give you a flavor of that. Um, they don't want the use of slimming down unless you're dieting. Uh, fostering unless you're rearing children, agenda unless it's for a meeting, commit or pledge to do something unless you're doing, uh, actually doing something, um, deliver something unless it's pizzas or the post, um, uh, deploy unless of military software, uh, dialogue unless you're actually speaking. Um, and we all recognize this, there's a kind of bullshit that it just, uh, pardon my French, but uh, it just interpenetrates a, a certain kind of administrative speak and and it's related in a certain sense to the same kind of thing that's going on with digitization um, that you have this casualness in the defining of things and now people who are care about language and care about literature of course bristle at those things and they they crave a certain degree of precision uh, a precision that comes out of discipline um, and it seems to me that um, we're in a situation where you know metaphors of brain consciousness thought and linking them to computers uh, is another sort of area in this, this, this range where we need to begin to articulate and put pressure once again on those hidden kinds of assumptions. And it seems to me one final suggestion that I have is that we have to recognize that many of the technologies that you described are consumer technologies. And so what we are is consumers of those technologies. And if you want your students to do things, you want them to be producers of knowledge um, and producers of technologies. And now, I don't know if that means making them coders, but one of the things I've noticed is that we are using applications and these are applications that are largely created in corporate uh, situations. So PowerPoint is my favorite example because PowerPoint was made for business um, and many of my colleagues hate bullet points and they hate the idea of reducing whatever their utterances and formulations are to bullet points and yet eh, there's something useful about it, right? Um, uh, but one of the things going on is that we don't develop, humanities people don't develop digital software of their own. They don't develop their own application for their own purposes. Um, and you know, my sense is, and I've been trying to do this in our lab, uh, is to develop actual tools um, that, that are designed to answer the kinds of questions and create the kinds of teaching tools that we would like in the classroom, um, rather than adapting what corporations have provided for us. Um, so um, to me, in a certain sense, it's that, um, that, that final notion of um, how are we going to uh, um, ultimately articulate our relationship to that inframing thing that is technology. Um, and, and that is a crucial mission for us, especially in the age of the corporate university. Thank you. We have some time for questions. So to Kara specifically, oh, am I holding it? Okay, yeah. I can do that. Uh, to Kara specifically, so at one point you said, uh, what does it mean to be makers, sharers, and consumers of photography? Right, did I get that right from your? Close, that's close enough. So, so what if we change the word photography to pornography? Or is a naked selfie just another kind of selfie and we can incorporate it under the same kinds of rubrics we use to study? the other ways in which photography have, has entered our lives. What about sex, basically, is what I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah, there was a moment when Anthony Weiner was in this talk and then came out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, Thank you. And I don't mean to make a joke about the issue because it is an issue. And, and what I would say is that I think anytime we talk about any use of technology, whether it's historical or contemporary, we have to be thinking about context and we have to be thinking about um, norms at, at any given context, right? So so part of the issue, you know, I mean, to now elaborate the, exhibit, the example that I wasn't going to talk about it cut out, part of the issue with Anthony Weiner that is interesting is uh, the argument that if people want to consent and do all of that, why can't they just do it? And why doesn't everybody kind of lighten up, right? So, and then of course there's a whole range of arguments on the other side. So, what I don't want to do is I don't want to suggest, you know, I think there is a kind of, a, probably we're all having, we don't want to be technological determinants. And as, a, as I prepared the talk, I thought, you know, I'm really claiming 
that this technology has changed the way we're doing thinking moving. But on the other hand, it has. Uh, but on the other hand, it hasn't, because these same kinds of questions um, emerge and reemerge, and we always have to engage them, right? Whether it's um, representations in terms of sex, uh, whether it's uh, issues of consumption and consumerism, whatever these issues are, they, they re-emerge uh, with each iteration of technology. But at the same time, we have to be able to recognize what's different now. John? Um, uh, thank you. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating presentations, uh, thought-provoking. Um, it, a little anecdote. I think that the uh, the, the techno, technical advancement which bothered me most was the alarm clock, <laughs> uh, because uh, it represents for me a departure from the interconnectedness of human life from uh, the human's natural surroundings. No longer did you have the rooster waking you up. You know. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and so what, what, is, what you've outlined for us is definitely true. I mean, our creative energies have led to vast developments which help us to produce three books in the same time, amount of time, that it normally would have taken previous scholars a, a one book to produce one. So we can be much more productive. We can interconnect much more rapidly. But, um, but there's something that does get lost in the whole process, as you, as you pointed out. And I think what um, uh, I, I keep being reminded of is various quotations. I love the quotations. And I immediately thought of cogito ergo sum. Yes, that's what's making me human, I think. Right? Or um, uh, ich, ich bin was ich esse. Right? Der Mensch ist, man ist was man isst. Right? One is what one eats. Well, you know, there's a bit of truth to each one. Yes, the body is a machine. But, uh, and the mind is a kind of really complicated computer. Um, but at the same time, as Kant recognized, uh, der Mensch is doch mehr als Maschine. The humankind is more than a mere machine. He's talking about, of course, um, emphasizing the social political status of the human being um, in society. Very, very quickly, I worked in, I'm from the Detroit area, and I worked in a Chrysler stamping plant on an assembly line. And my own body, my own mind, began to incorporate the rhythm of the line. And it became clear to me, after about four months of doing this, that uh, my co-workers, uh, okay, that one has been here for 25 years, that one has been here about 15, that one's about five. Why? Because the five, the guy who's, who has too much energy and is breaking away from the machine, has a quicker gait, hasn't been there long enough. So there's a deadening effect. What do we do in the humanities that can enliven the pace, can keep the mind and the, sense, the senses alert? Why don't we talk about core values anymore? That was the question, by the way. <laughs> well, I'll say something about the interreaction, interrelation of technology and the human. I mean, I think that what I've come to believe through a variety, with the help of a variety of uh, theorists, uh, Gilbert Simondon and being one most notably, is uh, in this idea that humans have co-evolved with technology, that there's not a kind of, this, this is not a, a battle or a fight, but actually that uh, as our technologies have evolved, we've evolved uh, with them. And I think that, you know, so Walter Benjamin was great at talking about the ways in which human actions were entrained to uh, either the factory or other things like lighting a match or a lighter or, or snapping a picture or things like that, or the way our sensorium was trained by the, by the cinema uh, to deal with the shocks of, let's say, walking through the city. And there's no question that that kind of thing is happening today as well. I noticed a couple of years ago when I was giving a talk uh, and reading a paper that while I was doing it, my hand was going like this, the way I would like move my touch screen or something like that. And it was just clearly a kind of bodily tick or automat, you know, automatism that arose from that, from that fact. The other night I had a dream um, 
about actually missing my flight to this conference. And uh, I needed to check my, uh, I think it was my phone, but it was some screen to find out what time my plane was. I wasn't sure if I had missed it or not. And I couldn't, the dream was about, you know, I couldn't get the screen to focus or I couldn't find it on the screen. So I think there is no question that uh, we do change in relation to our technologies. So now, core values. Well, I think that what I've always shied away from thinking about or language of core values. Uh, and I think that the core values have to involve not values that are separate from the world technology generally, but have to involve how we interact and how we co-evolve and share uh, this planet, basically, and with humans, but also with, uh, with non-humans as well. And I think that if we start thinking about core values on a kind of more planetary scale and on a collaborative scale, then I think it starts to get interesting and, in fact, I think really important. When we start to think of core values as being human as opposed to the rest of the world, whether it be animals, whether it be the ecosystem, whether it be our, our technologies and so forth, then I think that's when we get uh, into trouble. And I think that's when things start to fall apart. So. I think that um it's very difficult to talk about core values with respect to technology because uh, what, what does Van Gogh say? One cannot write with the pen and think about it at the same time. There's this kind of gestalt in the use of a technology that makes it very hard to find aesthetic and cultural distance from it to understand the value of it. Um, and sometimes when Sigmund Freud in one of his essays on the analytic method called recognition, repetition, working through, which is sort of a become kind of a touchstone for cultural theory, where, where Freud's idea becomes a model of, of how culture works. And, and in a certain sense, we recognize it, and then through use, we repeat it. And then the working through, of course, becomes the place where we come to some assessment of value. Uh, but I don't know if humans are capable of doing that in advance of the fact. Uh, that is, you have to repeat you know, 20 times for the good student right, to learn something. Uh, it's not, it's, it, repetition is required. And so we learn to use these things and we destroy and we maim and we, we ruin in the process of learning. Um, that, you know, that there's no way around that. Um, and so that, that factory experience and, and a, a couple centuries of factory experience came you know, as a realization of what that labor meant. Um, and especially because the voiceless were working there. Um, uh, we didn't hear it, right? We always had spokespeople for it. Uh, so, you know, you were proletarianized for a shift and you got out. Good for you. Um, it, it was good money. <laughs> yeah. It was very yeah. Good and for five dollars a day, Henry Ford made good, gave people good money, but he gave them something else, too. Um, Thanks. Um, I want to ask a question that I heard in all three of the papers, but in, but in very different ways or presentations. And it's a question about the epistemology of a visual and, and how um, visuality in particular works, not just in how, in Kara's paper, Kara's presentation, um, what gets circulated, you know, as experience or knowledge, how that happens anymore, right, and how we experience that quad, the pornography question. But also, you know, uh, when Steve was talking, you talked about one of the jobs of the humanities uh, Quad the Warren quote is making the relationship visible. And then with your paper, I thought, you know, this is also how, as, a, as an institution, reporting, making things visual, you know, what happens to listening, what happens to thinking, all the other, just to stay within a tactile <laughs> sphere for a second, but even outside of the tactile sphere, what happens when visuality trumps everything, not just as what counts for knowledge, but also with regard to the values we use about counting itself, because we can count the scene. Well, I really appreciate that question because I, I, I was thinking about the problem of visuality, but I, I decided to avoid it in, for the interest of time. <laughs> but I, I think that um, one of the tensions in, in the modern digital move is a move from a, a, another, another euphemism is reading versus searching. Um, and so there's a lot of so-called reading going on that's now searching. Um, 
And in that slippage, because reading is analog, you have to read a sequence and, you know, and searching is digital. Um, and it just matches them up. And in a certain way, there, I feel like there's a deep connection between that and visuality. Um, that uh, when, when people start to do visual cultural studies, the real question for people like uh, W.J.T. Mitchell was about, can we actually treat an image as a text? And what does it mean to call it a text? And ekphrasis and the, and the tension between literal textuality and figurative textuality. And I feel like there's been a huge slippage where nobody, that, that question is, is moot and sort of lies there waiting. But what people are doing is embracing a visuality as if it were causality. And I see that in epidemiology quite a bit. Pop culture is riddled with complex epidemiology being visualized. So movies like Outbreak and all of these things, they, 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 they create networks and images of networks where you know disease transmission is a cognitive process <laughs> um, where people read and investigate and compare many things it's not visually inductive but we love the idea that oh john snow looked at a pump saw a bunch of dots around it said ah that no he already had his hypothesis of a thesis of causality but we want to believe in visual induction because i think we're afraid of the severe induction that is required to actually learn something new um, uh, <laughs> And, 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 and it's a great fear because when something you need to solve is in front of you and you can't, uh, we, like, you know, we like to have the answer key, um, but, but we don't. Um, so I don't know, that maybe that's a little cynical, but I, I feel that that's the connection I would have made. I actually get really impatient with this question, <laughs> partly because the question of having too much visuality or too much visual goes back to Plato and earlier. Uh, and so this, on the one hand, there's always this kind of broad cultural narrative of we have too much visual, the visual is too dominant, people rely too much on the visual. On the other hand, we also seem to think that we all are pretty good at decoding the visual, but it's everybody else who's a dupe. <laughs> so I think about my, my colleagues who are social scientists who study the effects of media, and there's something that's called the third person effect that essentially s says, well, I know that that movie about that outbreak is, uh, you know, just a, but, but other people, children especially, oh my God, children, right? Protect the children. But other people will not know what I know because I am somehow more visually literate than everybody else. Now, this is not to say that I don't think that we should be interested in the question of the content of visual representations or the way that um, particular uh, institutional or corporate structures, you know, structure representation in a way that can be designed to manipulate. And that's not to say that people can't be manipulated. But I confess, at the level of kind of scholarly discourse, this question frustrates me uh, because I think it really, it, it, it suggests that consumers of visual images are not very smart. And I think if we actually study the ways that viewers, for example, of photographs, which is what one of the things that I've been doing lately in my work, if we study the way that viewers actually tell us that they're interacting uh, and, and working with and making arguments out of images, it just is so much more interesting and complicated. And I'm more interested in that than in that kind of bigger picture question, I guess. Well, I used to get really frustrated with that question, too, but because uh, when I would go on the road with remediation, we published it, people would say, you know, well, you're just talking about visual media, what about audio and so forth. But actually, I think uh, I'm not frustrated with that question any longer. And I think that the reason I'm not is because I think that the, what is behind that question in a way is not a folk, it, the way I've sort of re-understood it is not as a question of a focus on the visual versus other senses, but actually on a focus, as a focus on cognition, representation, and symbolic understanding as the kind of motivating forces in human behavior and human action. And so my work in the last decade or so has started to focus much more on uh, things like affect and on non-cognitive ways in which human beings are moved and move others. The circulation, I mean, disease doesn't circulate cognitively. Disease circulates in a very kind of embodied way, and I know that's not what you meant 
uh, when you said that. But, uh, but just to say that I think we have to, I think one of the things, again, just to keep this is my sort of humanities horse is that I'll keep beating, is um, that one of the things I think we need to do in the humanities is to uh, expand, not to get rid of, but expand our attentions and our concerns to turn towards the way in which uh, our own non-humanness, our body, is impacted uh, affectively, physically, uh, you know, by all sorts of ways, by uh, things like texts, images, and so forth. That is to say, we can read texts and we can read images, but there is an affective circuit that is also at work when we're doing that, and that is often beneath our recognition, our control, or our critical attention. And I think that we have been turning our attention to these things. I think we need increasingly to be doing that. And I think that will get us off the visual, or will get us to think about the visual in different ways, not just in terms of kind of semiotic symbolic systems, but in terms of um, more physical and material affect. Can I, can I follow up this? I'm, this has to be the last question, and, it's, and I'm going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm also very interested in this question. And one way to pose it, I guess, in the, in the context of, of humanities is, regardless of whether we think the visual is now has a new dominance or not, um, I think that there is a question whether or not our students need to be taught visual literacy in a different way than maybe that was true before. And yet, most of the disciplines that are represented here are, whether it's philosophy, history, uh, English, literature, are essentially text and reading oriented disciplines. And so I wonder if you think that, that this more visual moment, if you would allow me to call it that, has a kind of repercussion on the humanities, or at least that kind of humanities, that ought to wrench us more to a kind of concentration on, on understanding and analyzing the visual sphere. McLuhan would say that the visual, that the textual is visual. So I think that one of the things that media studies lets us see is that in fact this turn to the visual in the way that uh, I think it's often been done in visual studies is a, an extension of textuality. It's a textualization of the visual which is I think what Steve was saying when he was referring to uh, W.J.T. Mitchell saying can we see an image as a text. And so I don't see it as this turn to the visual as um, moving away from print, uh, the print that uh, dominates all of our disciplines. I think I see it actually as an extension or a reinforcement of that, or at least the way it's mostly been, been done. I think there are examples, though, where I, I would flip the question a little bit differently, I think with that caveat uh, in mind. But I would flip the question and, and say, um, Maybe rather than thinking about is you know are we more visual now? Uh, ask the question um, why haven't we noticed how visual we've always been? Uh, and and one of the that's that's one of the reasons why I study what I study in a field uh, of rhetorical studies, which is about oratory and text <laughs> and speech primarily. Um, and one of the the kind of I guess disciplinary narratives that I want to continually try to disrupt is this idea that, well, then we had to study television because mm -hmm. television came along, and then now we have to study the and, and now it's all visual, visual, mm -hmm. where, where I'm thinking, well, why aren't we looking at, you know, earlier moments of public debate and engagement and thinking about those as visual rhetorical examples. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>